Hey tea heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. In this video, Japanese teaware. In this video, I'm gonna be showing you the different types of Japanese teaware for brewing not just Japanese, but any type of tea. This video is gonna go under the teawares playlist. If at any point in time you enjoy this video, then give the video the thumbs up. The more thumbs in the air, the more tea videos are gonna come your way. And if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, then go click that button. Welcome to Tokoname in Japan. We are here, this is the capital of teaware in Japan and this is a very dangerous place for Celine and I because we are teaware geeks. Very obsessed with our teaware and we've already got full luggage so we can't purchase too much. But we're here officially to look for teaware potentially for Mayleaf. So if you're ready, let's go get our teaware geek on. I'm very privileged to have been invited to the workshop of Master Mehara and his son, Master Potters in Tokoname area. We've been talking about the intricacies of um, skill and design in producing teaware, especially we've been focusing on the Kyusu pot. And this man is in his 70s and he first took to the potter's wheel when he was 10 years old. So over 60 years of experience, but he is constantly and continually refining his craft. He was talking about how he's changing the, the spouts and changing the, the angle of the handles, all of these things. So it goes to show that this craft never ends and is constantly um, in flux and constantly developing and all this knowledge is being passed on, I'm sure, to his son. It's an amazing experience. This workshop is stunningly beautiful. It's the most bijou perfect little um, workshop and uh, the floors are stained red with this red clay which is full of iron. Again, has an effect on the tea, smooths out the green tea, so it has the same effect as the clay in Chinese teaware. But I'm not going to talk too much. Sometimes I need to know when to shut up and I'm just going to let you experience what over half a century's worth of dedication and craft looks like.
Okay guys, we're in a T-Wear showroom and we are in a lot of trouble because the choice here is mind-blowing. There's so much to choose from. It really is a feast for the eyes and um, we're in quite a lot of trouble because we're having to try to make some selections and the kind of T-Wear geeks in us um, are making sure that we're going to be spending a lot of money. I want to show you our shortlist. We've got a shortlist of about 10 here and we're going to quickly talk about you know, the Japanese teaware. And this is the archetypal Japanese teapot. This is the Kyusu. Um, apparently the kind of meaning behind it is Kyusu is a quick serving. It all uh, comes from the fact that they've shrunk down the size of the pots so you can serve quickly. And the feature of Kyusu is the side handle. The side handle allows you to just put your thumb and finger and it holds really, really nicely. I know I look a bit awkward there because I'm worried about getting it out of shot here, but it holds really, really nicely and you just pour with your wrist. So with Gaiwans and with uh, Chinese uh, teapots, it's a, a lot more elbow action when you're pouring um, and the Japanese find that less movement is more graceful and so just pouring with the wrist is something that is really desired. And the angle, you can take a look here, from the spout to the handle is slightly less than 90 degrees um, so that when you pour you really don't have to do anything it's a natural movement of the wrist to get a very very straight pour another thing to look out for is to try to get um, a kyusu with a sieve which is not stainless steel so this is all clay um, and that's something that's desired they get, you have ones that go in and ones that go out depending on the type of tea but this is a really nice thing you know don't use stainless steel if possible here try and keep it pure clay so that you are getting the full effects of the clay all the way through until the pour so you're gonna have to help me out here guys a little bit I'm gonna um, number these for you so that you can tell me which one is your favorite or are your favorites because I'd be interested to hear let's call this one Kyusu number one. Yeah, we'll get some shots of it um, so you can see this lovely Kyusu here. Now we're going to show you, I really like this one, Kyusu number two, a smaller one. You know how much of a sucker I am for small teaware. The more you drink tea, the smaller your teaware I find. And this one here is a darker clay so the clay depends the type of clay depends on the artist the potter that is um, making them what they choose and also how hot they fire them sometimes they double bake them to to bring out the the darkness in the clay as well so it's a, a variety of factors here really really nice so we'll call that kyusu number two this one here kyusu number three again i'm going to put it down so we can get some cutaways it has a really nice detailing on the lid really nice subtle two-tone two color here again a darker one but very very nice indeed this is q suit number four i really like this one a little bit extra color these are all handmade by the way i forgot to mention these are all made entirely by hand um, so these have all have signatures at the bottom by the artist these are all handmade and um, as you saw before, the skill to make these is quite incredible. Um, so this is Q suit number four. So those are four Q suits that you can uh, pick your favorite on. Then we have this little fella here. This is a Shibori Dashi and this is for Gyokuro. So for Gyokuro, highest grade um, long shade grown tea. And this is for long steeping times at very, very cool temperatures. It doesn't have a um, filter, it just has some lines. If you can focus on that, Celine. Yeah, so it's a really, really nice one. Shibori Dashi literally means squeeze pouring because you're squeezing on the sides. So squeeze pouring, I really like this. I've got my eye on this one. And just for something different, we'll call this one number uh, one, two, three, four, number six. So the Shibori Dashi was number five. This is a pot which is number six. And this is obviously a more classic teapot shape, but it's a really nice size, especially for Sencha um, and for um, 
other potential tees I can imagine using this for ball rolled oolongs because of its height the oolongs will grow and expand really nicely in a pot this shape. So there are one, two, three, four kyusus, one shibori dashi and one pot. Tell me which one you love the most. But before we go, I'm going to show you Celine's favorite pots. But she has very expensive taste. Okay, take a look at this. Um, again, I'll put it down so we can get a close-up shot of it. But this is, again, all handmade with the blossom um, carved into the clay, into the red clay. And um, it is just a stunning, stunning pot. Really beautifully decorated um, and takes a lot of work. When we spoke to uh, the master today um, regarding pots like this, he said that they can take up to a few months to make. So that's a really beautiful pot. We'll throw that out there to you. So this will be one, two, three, four, five, six. This is number seven. If you like this one, number seven, the price is much, much, much higher. Um, so, you know, you have to be special inquiries for number seven. And number eight, I really love this one as well. Um, again, fabulous design, fabulous working on here. Really, really incredible. I'll put it down so we can get a shot of it. So this is a dark chocolate brown clay and it has again a blossom um, but with white uh, detailing on it which is stunning. The balance on all of these are great. Sticking um, um, your finger under the, the base and your thumb on the top and holding the handle is just a, such a natural pouring action. Really, really beautifully weighted. You can also check the balance on them. You can see if they stand up. It doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's a better pot, but standing up it shows you the balance that they have. And I better be careful because if this falls, I've got a big bill and I don't have a nice Q suit to take home with me. So we've got our eye on all of these, but this showroom is packed. There's, there's so much choice here in Tokoname. I highly recommend if you come to Japan, come visit Tokoname and uh, make sure you've got enough space in your luggage. One key difference between Japanese style brewing and Gong Fu style brewing in China is that in China they use a Gong Dao Bei or fairness cup. So they decant from the pot into the Gong Dao Bei. That means that everybody gets to taste the same strength infusion and the leaves are ready for the next infusion. But with Japanese style brewing, they pour directly from the Kyusu or whatever the brewing vessel they're brewing in directly into the cups. And for that reason, the cups have to be bigger because the capacity of the cup has to be about or similar size to the Kyusu, maybe two cups to one Kyusu or one large cup to a Kyusu. That way they can pour out the entire contents of the tea that's brewed and the leaf is not sitting and stewing. So when you're brewing Japanese style, you're going to be having to select larger cups. However, I can't shake the Chinese in me. Let me show you what I like to drink from. I like to drink in small cups. I can't escape the, the desire to drink from small vessels like this. And in Japan, they have lots of these nice small cups, really, really beautiful. But in Japan, they're used for sake. So I am probably gonna be picking up some sake cups for my personal collection. And it's interesting because sake is an alcohol and they drink it as shots. And I like to drink tea as shots, strong brewed Gong Fu style. But this is a matter of choice. This is up to you. If you want to go traditional Japanese style, then by all means, get larger cups. We have got about 10 more minutes before we've got to rush off to our train. We've got plenty in our baggage. So my pockets are nearly empty and we're gonna head off into the sunshine and head down to Kyoto. We are back in London and we have in front of us our selection that we picked up when we were in Tokoname. We only purchased a small amount of these tea wares. Um, they're already up online, but it's a very small amount. Um, we're interested to hear your comments, which ones you liked the most from the selection that I showed you in Tokoname, and then we'll be ordering more. But let me show you what we currently have in stock, and then we're gonna get to brewing with uh, one of them. So we've got this red clay uh, Tokoname Kyusu, this is a larger capacity Q, so this is 350 mil. It's got a nice uh, spiraled pattern on it. Really, really nice spiral pattern. And it's got, as I said before, um, a um, filter which is made entirely of clay. So this is a red clay, 
350 ml, so it's a nice size for, for brewing in slightly larger groups, not your standard um, Chinese Gong Fu sizes of kind of 100 to 200 mil. This is uh, 350 mil. This pot here is also 350 mil. We like to use this when we are brewing um, ball rolled oolongs, um, oolongs or teas that need to expand upwards. And again, for larger groups of people. So 350 uh, mil, this is kind of a green feather um, pattern on a black clay. And the color of the clay is not just dependent on the um, type of clay that they use, but also how it was fired, the temperature and the level of oxygen. So if you fire the red clay in low oxygen, it tends to go darker and go black. Then we've got this Kyusu here. This is um, made uh, again with clay, and this is in the Gyoko Yohen style, which is this kind of scorched, really interesting two-tone and every, every pot is different, every cuse is different, but it's got that black clay moving to this um, lovely um, tarnished, um, slightly burnt looking uh, color, really, really nice. And it's got this yushime, um, uh, sorry, kushime uh, pattern, which is this comb pattern. So you can see the comb pattern on it. And this is 150 ml, so this is more your standard kind of Gong Fu style serving uh, size. Um, nice for, for single people or for people with like a group of two, three, maybe four um, guests um, in small cups. So this is uh, the, uh, the black Kyusu, 150 ml. And then we picked up um, a Yuzumashi. Now these are traditionally used in Japan to cool down water. So if you have boiling hot water and you pour it into this, the tea ware absorbs the heat and the water will cool down. And so you can start to control temperature by pouring it into cups um, and pouring it into the yuzumashi. So you don't need it. You can also just pour the water, hot water into an empty pot and that will also take away about 10 degrees. So every time you pour hot water into cold tea ware, it'll take down the temperature by about 10 degrees. It's not, an, not totally accurate, but it helps to cool down the water if you don't have a temperature thermometer, which we don't have with us right now. So this is the Yuzumashi, but we use it also for a Gongdao Bay. As I said um, in Japan, I don't particularly like, unless I've got the perfect size cups to, to uh, the Kyusu, I don't really like to um, pour directly into cups because there's always the chance that you're going to leave a little bit of water sitting in the in the kyusu or pot and that's going to stew and that's going to mean that your next infusion is is uh, compromised so if we empty the entire kyusu into the yuzumashi or any other gongdao bay you can then use it to serve and it means that you've got your even brew for everybody to taste and the leaves are ready for the next infusion one thing that we didn't pick up we didn't pick up any hohins or hobins or hojins and essentially a hohin is uh, similar to a kyusu uh, it's got a lid but it doesn't have the handle so you're pouring it like this you're pouring it more in a kind of guy one style and if uh, I have a preference, I prefer the Guy One on that. So we didn't pick up any Ho Hins. Um, I love the shape um, and the design of the um, Kyusu. You can see the balance on these are excellent. Really, really lovely balance. You've got that um, slightly under 90 degrees angle here, which makes it a very, very comfortable pour. The, lead, uh, the lids are nicely tight fitting. So the way that you hold a Kyusu, thumb on top, forefinger at the bottom or index finger on the bottom and then just a twist of the wrist as I said they like to uh, the Japanese like smaller movements um, less of a kind of dramatic um, guy one um, style uh, pour um, and so that's really uh, the kind of more understated way of serving apologies for some reason helicopters deciding to go all over heads today um, all right so those are the tea wares that we picked up. Let us know which ones you like, not just from this, but also from the selection that we showed you in Tokoname. I am thirsty, it's time to drink. Let me introduce you to what we're drinking today. This is our new Kanaya Midori Sencha. This is a wonderful Sencha that we picked up when we were in Japan. Really, really happy with this find. Let's quickly scope this tea. Season, this is May 2017, um, so, um, spring picked. 
The cultivar, this is Kanaya Midori, which is a cross between the Yabukita and an indigenous cultivar, an ind indigenous variety growing in Shizuoka. It was released, I think, around the 1970s, um, and it's a really, really interesting um, cultivar with some nice flavor notes that we'll get onto that when we do the tasting. Uh, the origin, this is from Kagoshima, uh, Kirishima uh, uh, area of Kagoshima in the south of Japan. So right on the southern tip of Japan, very, very close to the sea, like right on the coast. Um, and I really feel that with this tea, I know that Japanese teas, Japanese green teas tend to have quite a lot of minerality, have a little bit more of that marine air freshness to it. That's just the nature of Japanese green teas. But something about Kagoshima green teas for me has that extra little bit of sea saltiness, which I really, really like. The uh, picking and processing of this is um, a bud and one or two leaves. And um, it goes through a whole process of um, steaming. This is Asamushi, so this is lightly steamed. This is an Asamushi uh, sencha. And uh, it goes through the steaming and goes through a whole process of drying and then rolling. Um, I've done another video about that. I'll put a link in the description below. And finally, elevation. Uh, Japan is not super high elevation tea. This is about 270 meters, which is pretty high for Japanese um, tea. So we're going to be brewing this up. Um, we've got our black uh, clay Kyusu here. This is 150 mil, as I said. And one thing I forgot to mention is with a uh, with the clay, uh, the Japanese clay, it's going to have an effect. It will have an effect in terms of smoothening the, uh, the astringency of the tea in the same way as uh, Chinese clay pots will do. I think that they're quite similar in effect to more of the Chaozhou clay pots. So the higher um, temperature fired, less porous, so it's not so dramatic the effect, but it certainly is there. And similarly, because of the fact that it's slightly less porous, it's not gonna have the um, same capacity to season. That's not to say that it won't season. So if you brew green tea um, or a particular type of tea in the pot for um, an extended period of time, it will season and it will contribute to the flavor um, of uh, subsequent brews, but it is very, very subtle much more subtle than uh, Yixing clay, similar to a Chaozhou um, clay. And so in terms of preparing these pots, if you buy them, you don't really need to prepare them, not in the same way as a Yixing pot. Um, you just really need to make sure you rinse it with hot water. Um, and if you want to kind of kickstart the seasoning process, you can brew very strong tea. So put some green tea in or put whatever tea you want um, to, um, you've chosen for the pot put the water in and let it sit for about 10-15 minutes, let it brew, you can even leave it longer than that, then pour it out and kind of kickstart the seasoning process. I don't do that, that's not something that I do because really for me the power of clay is not just the aesthetics but also the kind of smoothening, softening effect that the clay has rather than the seasoning effect. But then that's up to you. All right, so let's brew. Um, so I've got 150 mil uh, kyusu here. I've got about six grams here. So I like to kind of do a semi-Japanese, semi-gongfu style brewing for my uh, Japanese teas. Normally with Japanese uh, tea instructions, usually they'll put a little bit less leaf per Per 100 ml of water than I do. I like to increase it a bit and then reduce the temperature a little bit more. So I like to brew my uh, centuries at under 80 degrees, kind of 70 to 80 degrees. Uh, and so we're going to use the Yuzamashi to cool down the water. This kettle has um, just come off the boil when we were, um, when I started filming. So it's probably at around 90, 95 degrees Celsius. Um, which is about 205 to 210 Fahrenheit. The moment I pour it into here, it's gonna drop by about 10 degrees. So I think what I'll do instead, because I wanna get it under about 80 degrees. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm first gonna pour it into the Kyusu. So that will take it down. This is now heating up the Kyusu. That's gonna take down the temperature to probably something around 85 degrees, um, which is around um, 195 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And then I'm going to then transfer that water into the Yuzamashi. 
and that should take it down further. So now this is going to be something in the region after a while that's going to be something in the region of about 75 to 80 degrees um, Celsius which is about 175 degrees Fahrenheit. Right now I'm going to put these leaves in gorgeous leaves really nice dark dark green kind of like those dark uh, leather sofas you know that you um, that are very popular in libraries and things like that those that dark green leather color very very glossy that's what you want to look for in Japanese tea very very glossy um, we're going to put that in and I'm going to give this a sniff biscuity it's got a biscuity warmth as well as it as well as all of the um, marine air it's got some cut grass it's got some vegetable notes um, sea vegetables though things like samphire um, like sea asparagus that kind of um, uh, note to it rather than in the fields and this is what I mean about Kagoshima I feel that it's got a little bit more of that sea note to it not fishy no I'm not talking, talking about anything kind of fishy or marine life I'm talking about that really fresh bracing sea air but definitely a biscuity warmth to it a little kind of a, a slight uh, warmth porridgey milkiness to it okay so this now I'm sure is about the right temperature water we don't rinse with Japanese uh, teas um, this is an organic tea by the way um, so this um, is certified organic and we are going to brew this for about two minutes one and a half to two minutes and so the reason why I brew Japanese green teas longer than I would for Chinese green teas really um, it's a, a few different reasons the first reason is that the Japanese tea production is the, the way that they produce their tea is all about trying to maximize the umami content and minimize the the kind of catechin content so the the theanine that the leaf creates gets trans uh, gets um, uh, changed into catechins as the sun starts to kind of uh, uh, shine on the leaves the Theanine turns into catechins, and it's those catechins that bring out that kind of astringency and bitterness. And so because of the fact that the Japanese are very sensitive in their growing and production techniques uh, with the use of organic fertilizers and the use of shading, they tend to try to protect the theanine from changing into catechins. And therefore, you get a much smoother um, general brew, and therefore you can afford, it can afford to be brewed a bit longer. I also think that the steaming of the tea which is the practice that's done in Japan versus China the steaming of the tea softens and smoothens the tea as well um, and so it, it produces less of a, a, a kind of spiky notes less bright notes that you need to temper with gong fu brewing the other thing is I actually just like the taste of Japanese green tea brewed a little bit more with um, a little bit extra volume in it I find that that's that that's what I'm looking for in a Japanese green tea more than a Chinese green tea where it's much more about the elegance and delicacy and purest purity um, for me in Chinese green teas so I like to brew this at a lower temperature 70 degrees but for longer and I think that that's probably about two minutes of me waffling so again holding at the top index finger at the bottom and then just pour and it's very simple um, the filter in here is really really good it's not going to um, uh, catch absolutely everything but it takes most of the broken leaves if you are um, brewing fukumushi style so the very deep steam style which is more broken you may want to put it through another fine filter um, um, uh, to, to really capture those really small particulates which are inevitable with fukumushi style um, I want you to see the color of this liquor so I'm going to pour into a glass Gong Dao Bay. Take a look at this. This is the, the look that you're going for with, with Sencha. Just pure sunshine, right? Uh, a kind of chartreuse, slightly green, yellow, luminous, fluorescent, vibrant. Just, just hits you in the face with this amazing bright color. And it's quite cloudy, you can't see through it. It's almost like a kind of paint 
uh, it's it's so it's 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 so kind of misty and cloudy and that's really really beautiful it's it's just a different look to chinese green tea completely different look and that is because of the way that it's produced the way that it's uh, the cultivars that they use um, and their sensitivity to um, bringing out other types of flavors so i'm drinking out of a sake cup as i said in the video so this is a sake cup that we picked up cheers everybody Um, texture is thick. That's one of the key components of um, maintaining that theanine is thickness. And you can taste the theanine, which brings that umami flavor. Not as strong as a gyokuro, of course, but it's definitely there. It's brothy. It's vegetal. I'm getting the, the sea air. I'm getting that samphire. Those those brassica vegetables. I'm even getting a little bit of cut grass, but very close to the sea. But what I like about this Kanaya Midori cultivar grown in Kagoshima is that with all of that, with all of that mineral brightness, with all of that savory sweetness, you also get this warmth, kind of oaty, oaty, biscuity, porridge, creaminess, a slight creaminess, a light milkiness, maybe a nut milk or an oat milk or an avocado creaminess. So that green um, taste, but with that creamy texture, not just texture, but also flavor. I am getting a tiny whisper of astringency. Beautiful. That's what I want. Just enough. It's a lovely temperature. Really, really the right temperature for me. Use more leaf and drop the temperature, then maybe your standard Japanese uh, tea brewing instructions. Cheers, everyone. Some bright notes. A little bit of the kind of lemon zest, lemon pith. That slight bitterness, the lemon pith bitterness, um, but zesty, pleasant, enjoyable. Nothing that's lasting, nothing that's a kind of um, chemical or pharmaceutical bitterness in any way. Strong, I'm sure we can get quite a few infusions out of this. This is just really opening up. And with subsequent infusions, drop the, temper uh, drop the time of brewing down. Because now these leaves have fully or are starting to hydrate, open up. They do not need such a long brew. I would break it down to, to maybe even under 30 seconds. Um, so you need to experiment. Japanese green tea, um, like all tea, but I think Japanese green tea especially is quite sensitive to, to, to differences in times and temperature. So experiment, but I would really recommend that subsequent brews, you drop the time down. Um, so let's do this. I'm gonna pour into the yuzamashi. And because I'm sensitive of time, I'm going to pour directly in. I would normally leave this a little bit longer. So now we are gonna brew much shorter. So I would say about 20 to 30 seconds should be fine here. While I just finish this off, really lovely cloudy liquor. When you have gyokuro, we'll do a video about gyokuro soon. Um, it's even cloudier, it's, 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 it's crazy cloudy. Uh, um, um, translucency it's really you can't see through it at all but with this it's 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 sunshine it's 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 yellow bright sunshine yellow it's it's a fabulous color really nice texture okay let's pour this out and the color changes this is what's also really interesting so I'm gonna show you just put this away. I'm going to show you the second infusion. And now you can see less cloudy. It's still cloudy, but now I can start to see through it a little bit more. And um, the color, I would say is is has changed as well. It's still vibrant. It's still very, very fluorescent um, yellow green. But I would say it's kind of moved more into the green spectrum a little bit. All right, final taste of this. 
the finish that it's leaving me is like sweet porridge oats milky oats but sweet and that's the umami the savory turning to sweetness definitely hotter water and when you increase the temperature of the water what you do is you reduce the softness you increase the minerality now it's more rocky the astringency is a little bit more forward but it's still delicious less of the butteriness oh sorry not butteriness less of the warmth biscuitiness that you get when you brew it at lower temperature fresh vibrant asparagus cut grass lovely smell the empty sake cup back to the dry leaf smell samphire seashells definitely a walk by the coast but somewhere very verdant and green so that's your kanaya midori censure a perfect example of a great kagoshima style censure with the kanaya midori um, cultivar and this is our latest kyusu you've seen the selection let us know your thoughts on the selection that we showed you in tokoname and uh, the selection that we brought back here and we'll definitely be finding some more Japanese teaware for you. That's it tea heads. If you made it to the end of this video, then please give the video the thumbs up. Check out our YouTube playlist and let us know if there are any videos that you'd like us to make. If you're ever in London, then come visit us in Camden to say hi and taste our wares. If you have any questions or comments, then please fire them over. Other than that, I'm Don from Mayleaf. Thank you for being a part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags. Keep drinking the good stuff and spread the word because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye.